Hi everybody, this is Marlene with Stories of the Supernatural and today I wanted to delve into one of the areas that I find most fascinating in researching uh, paranormal or haunted stories which is true life, uh, true crime stories and one of the following, this happened at the turn of the century and it's for a, a blog article that I did recently called Mrs. Bluebeard. Now, at the end, I'm also going to throw in some extra ghost stories, so stay put for that. It's not just about the true crime. I also have some really good stories about haunted places. But let's go back now to Chicago, October 1922. man by the name of Joseph Klimek. His guardian angels are working overtime on his behalf. They may have dropped the ball when he married his wife, Tilly, but they used his brother to assist because due to his suspicions and a visit to the doctor, it proved what he feared, that his brother was being poisoned. Now, the police initially arrested Tilly, Klimek, and her son into investigating the supposed poisoning of Mr. Klimek. Now, as they start going back into Tilly's background, it painted a very disturbing picture. It seemed everyone around her died, including several prior husbands. Within two weeks, an order was issued to Zumer's second husband, Frank Kupazic. Now, uh, this was not something that was normally done, especially since his death certificate stated he died from pneumonia. However, enough arsenic was found in his system to kill four persons. So, of course, after that, there was an exhumation order for her other husbands. Next one was Joseph Matskowitz. This was Tilly's first husband. And also another man by the name of Joewick Sterner. He was the husband to Nellie Sterner Kulik. Who is Nellie? Well, it turns out she's Tilly's cousin. And Tilly, upon her arrest, said that it was her cousin Nellie who provided her with rat poison and uh, to sprinkle it on the food. Now, Nellie, at this point, gets arrested as well, and it didn't help any that the police received an anonymous letter asking them to look into her husband's death, which it was alleged was a result of poisoning. Now, within a few hours of being arrested, Tilly confessed to the police, stating she was tired of her husband fooling around on her. However, that didn't explain that she had cashed in on multiple life insurance policies that she had procured in the event of his death and the fact that she was a widow many times over. Now, another common law marriage that she had was with a man by the name of John Ruskaski, and he died in 1914, only five months after living with Tilly. Then Harry Sweeta, Tilly's cousin, contacted the state attorney's office and called their attention to the mysterious death of his sister Rose after eating dinner at the Klimek household. Of course, this was food prepared by Tilly. Now, eating with Tilly could very well be your last meal. When Harry came forward, another cousin by the name of Elizabeth Wiskowski told of the mysterious death of two sisters and a brother after they broke bread with the Klimeks. The police then followed the trail to the graves of three infants. Two were the children of Nellie Kulik, and the third was her grandchild. It was around this time that the press started to compare Tilly Klimek with that of Belle Gunnis and her murder farm in Indiana that had occurred just 10 years before. Lieutenant Malone of the West Chicago Avenue Police Station found that Tilly had given birth at that time to 15 children, six which had died. Now, in 1917, Nellie Kulik, which is Tilly's cousin, had given birth to a set of twins, named Benjamin and Sophia. Her husband, Wojcik Sturmer, refused to recognize the children as his, claiming she had been unfaithful. Now, one child died when he was eight months old, and then the second one died a month later. By the time she was arrested, she was mother to 13 children, unknown how many of those had passed away. Further police investigation found out that Nellie Kulik, when she was married to Mr. Sturmer, frequently had arguments, and it turned out it was over Mr. Kulik, who eventually became her husband. Of course, Mr. Sturmer's body was disinterred, and it was found that he had enough arsenic in his system to kill several persons. 
Now, another one of the infants that the death was looked into was a child by the name of Dorothy Sparrow. She was Nellie Kulik's granddaughter. It seemed that Mrs. Kulik and her daughter frequently argued over her mother's manner of living. After the child was left in her care, she died of mysterious causes. Fast forward to February 27, 1923. Tillick Klimek was slated to stand trial. The star witness would be her last husband, Joseph Klimek, who didn't die but was still recovering several months afterwards in the hospital. Along with their cousin Nellie, they were accused of poisoning 20 persons. The crimes were heinous enough that the prosecution was seeking the death penalty and if granted, they would be the first woman executed in the state of Illinois. Along with several family members, there were even neighbors who whispered about dogs dying after eating scraps from the dinner table at the Klimek's household. This is a little bit of information about Tilly. She was born Otile Burek in Poland on October 22, 1877. She was the eldest of seven children born to Mikalina and Michelle Gubrick and she immigrated as a four-year-old with her family, and they settled in Chicago's Little Poland, which is near Northside. This area had the second largest Polish population next to Warsaw. Then in 1895, when she's 18 years old, she married 22-year-old Joe Mikowitz. He worked as an inspector for the IC Railroad, and by July of 1896, they had their first child named Joseph, and they rented a house on Sloan Street. Now, during her 29 years of marriage, she earned a reputation as a very good cook and, strangely enough, as a seer. It seems she could predict impending deaths. The dreams usually involved argumentative neighbors and stray dogs. Now, back in those times and in that culture, divorce was out of the question. So, at the beginning of January 1914, Tilly started telling neighbors that she dreamt her husband, Joe, was ill and would soon die. On cue, he passed away on January 13th. The cause of death was listed as heart trouble. Tilly's payoff was freedom and a $1,000 check from the life insurance company. He was buried in All Saints Polish National Catholic Cemetery. Not one to be sentimental, she married her second husband, Joseph Rukskaski, on February 27th, 1914. 30 days later, Poor Joe Number Two, we'll call him Joe Number Two, was the subject of another of Tilly's premonitions. And on May 20th, 1914, he went to join Joe Number One in the cemetery, leaving Tilly with $1,200 in cash and $722 in life insurance. Yes, that's in the span of four to five months. She became a widow twice over. What are the odds of that? Now, here comes Joe number three. His name was Joseph Guskowski. Now, he thought he was safe by not marrying Tilly. Wrong. Turns out, one day he shares some candy that Tilly made for him, shares it with his sister Stella. Both of them become violently ill. And apparently, she felt that she was jilted, and that was her reason for poisoning him. He mysteriously died of sometime after, also in 1914. I guess Tilly thought it was prudent to wait a while before offing any more family members or husbands. So fast forward to March of 1919. Tilly ties the knot with a man by the name of Frank Kupasek. They lived at 924 North Winchester Avenue, Chicago. Tilly had once lived there with a man by the name of Myers. That's the only thing they, they knew about him who had strangely gone missing didn't take long for Tilly to start foretelling about husband number four's demise. He died April 20th, 1921. Neighbors later described that she played festive music on her Victrola when he died. Now, the coroner's report listed his cause of death as bronchial pneumonia, and Tilly collected $675 from his life insurance policy. Now, one has to wonder if there was a dearth of women in Little Poland in those years, because on July 30th, 1921, this is three months after her prior husband's death, Tilly married a wealthy man by the name of Joseph Klimek. This was Joe number four. In a well-rehearsed pattern, she had her husband take out a life insurance policy. 
then he started feeling sick. Apparently, his family, especially his brother, were a little bit suspicious, so they called in a doctor. The doctor examined him and confirmed that he was being poisoned. I imagine about this time he gulped and he remembered that their dog killed over after eating scraps from the table and Tilly's soup had a queer taste to it. Now, once she ended up going off to prison instead of the gallows, there were those, believe it or not, that claimed that she ended up there because she had never gone to the beauty parlor. And because lots of her neighbors swore that she sprinkled white powder on cuts of cold meat and fed them to four of her husband, each of which had a hefty life insurance payoff. The only one that escaped was number four, who was discovered to be suffering from arsenic poisoning, which was, of course, the last one, and who testified against her. Now, the reason for that opinion was that Tilly's sentence, okay, was so much more severe than several women of those time periods who had been accused of killing a boyfriend or a husband, it was found that in the cases where the women were younger or beautiful or well-dressed, they got a lot more benign sentence than what Tilly got. With her dull brown hair, there was no dashing smile that could get her out of the sentence. Even her defense attorneys, who understood too well the power of a charming woman, whispered, she hasn't a chance to beat it. Now, Tilly ended up in Joliet for the murder of her third husband, which was the only charge that was brought against her out of all the ones, and uh, possibly her disregard for beauty and guile. Or perhaps instead it was the perfect disguise for a cold-blooded serial killer who appeared to be a dumpy housewife, but in reality did away with husbands and family alike. Now, Nellie, which was her cousin, spent a year behind bars and... uh, In the meantime, Tilly relentlessly tormented her by telling her, Oh, they're going to hang you today, Nellie. Tilly would whisper this in Polish as guards removed her from the cell, causing poor Nellie to scream in terror. In actuality, Nellie's trial ended in a hung jury, and it was followed by an acquittal, so she only spent a year in prison. Tilly died on November 20th in 1936, and she was buried in Bohemian National Cemetery. Uh, I'll put a link in the show if you want to look at an actual list of all of her victims, uh, the ones that survived and the ones that didn't. But the following are a few very interesting ghost stories about Chicago, which is where the story of Tilly Klimek takes place. Now, these are not the general ones about Resurrection Mary, the hitchhiking ghost, etc., The first one that we're going to go to is a location of where now is a Hooters. It's on the corner of Erie and Wall Street near Northside. And once upon a time, back in 1875, as a matter of fact, there was an article written by the Chicago Tribune describing the following. Hard and stiff, the death rigor intensified by the bitter cold, there lay upon the next slab the naked form of a beautiful woman. Stockings covered the feet and a portion of the shapely limbs, but the rest of her person was entirely nude. Okay, this was describing the naked bodies of women found in barrels where the Hooters on Wells now sits. Employees and those near the property whisper about voices in the basement, but their origin always remained a mystery. However, somebody doing a little bit of research came up with that article and it's a possibility that those spooky sounds could be explained by the historic discovery of the barrels which were labeled poultry and were stored there by grave robbers how about some wings huh okay now we go on to the place where Tilly Klimek used to live this was at the 900 block of North Winchester Avenue in the East Ukrainian village now you already heard about uh, Tilly's story. Okay, now one of the stories told was that when her third husband, Frank, lay dying, this was, of course, in the 1920s, he told his wife he was feeling a little bit better. However, as his illness progressed, she showed up at home bragging about the bargain $30 coffin she'd bought. All right, now, of course, it seems that uh, she was quite the psychopath, not only killing her husbands, but actually tormenting them 
while they were dying. Now, the Klimek household still stands, uh, and people that live there have reported freaky feelings in parts of the building where coffins were stored. Now, uh, as to whether this is anything to do with Tilly, uh, any of her victims, her husbands, who knows? But uh, from what I understand, the building's Wi-Fi is named Old Lady Tilly Klimek's Haunted House. No, how about that? Next location is the Haunted Condos, or in other words, the real Sausage King. Location is 1735 West Diversity Parkway in Lincoln Park. Chicagoans typically think of the Sausage King as Abe Froman from Ferris Bueller's Day Off. However, the real Crown Prince once belonged to a man by the name of Adolf Lukert. Lukert, former Sausage Factory, was converted to a group of condos on Diversity. Now, there have been reports of ghostly sightings and weird occurrences in the basement in recent decades. But most current residents probably don't know the story about Rukert's real history. In the late 1890s, Lukert murdered his wife and boiled down her body in one of the sausage factory's large vats. Her body didn't make it into the product, but the case was one of the first times forensic evidence was used at the trial. The only thing remaining of Lukert's wife were bone fragments coming from the sausage king that's really creepy All right let's move on to the next haunted place in chicago this is a strange tale of the brewster apartments this location is at 2800 north pine grove avenue in lincoln park now the brewster apartments have a terrifying roots both recent and historic in 1988 it was a filming location for the movie child's play remember chucky but the building's ghostly history began decades before. Back in July 31st of 1895, at that time it was known as the Lincoln Park Palace, it was supposed to be the ritziest apartment complex around. And as a matter of fact, Charlie Chaplin once lived there. Now, during construction, a supervisor fell to his death from the ninth floor in a freak accident. Then, on July 31st, 2013, 118 years to the day, the building's historic water tower toppled into the alley, nearly killing a few people nearby. As you all know, hotels are usually hotbeds of paranormal activity. So whether it's that unfortunate construction worker who fell to his death, I'm sure there's lots of other candidates that maybe didn't make the papers that might be walking around that place. Now, the next one we go to, is called the Tonic Room. Location is 2447 North Halsted Street in Lincoln Park. The story attached to this location is that a few years ago, it was taken over by new ownership. During some renovations in the basement, workers removed a worn-looking dagger from a window well. On the floor of the basement, they found the remains of a painted-on pentagram. That's when weird things started happening. Right after it was removed, a bouncer went to the basement and suddenly felt paralyzed. This was the location where the pentagram was at. He went down to the crown and couldn't move, couldn't talk, and they took him to the hospital. Doctors said there was nothing wrong at all with him. Now, to this day, the owners of the tonic room won't move the dagger from where it is, except to show it off if asked nicely. Now, the basement at one point was occupied by a male witch by the name of Frederick de Archaga, who was there in the late 1960s and early 70s, who sold occult paraphernalia and used the space as a pagan temple. The Archaga considered himself the Pontifex Maximus of the Sabian religious order, which he founded, declaring the basement the Temple of the Moon. Wow. Okay, next location is the Chicago Fire Department District 1 headquarters on the corner of Illinois and Dearborn Street near Northside. Between 1872 to 1927, the fire station was home to a prison. Now, during that time, nearly 100 convicts were hanged there, including one gruesome case in which a prisoner had to be hanged twice because the rope broke. It was also there that Mayor Carter Harrison Sr.'s assassin, Patrick Pendergast, was hanged. Prendergast, who was thought to be mentally ill, often complained the prison was haunted. Now, till this day... 
There are stories told that firefighters do not like staying overnight at the station. When the prison still stood, it supposedly was haunted by the ghosts of all the prisoners that had been hanged there. The next story involves a historic location known as the Hull House. It's located at 800 South Halstead Street, University Village. Now, Hull House is known for being famously haunted uh, by the Devil Child, but there are several myths that surround this location. One is that it was built on Native American burial ground. Another one is that the house is on a graveyard for dead children. A uh, third is that the local tribe that used to live on that area did a ghost dance. Uh, another one is that it was the inspiration for Rosemary's baby. Research has proven that none of those have any basis in truth. In fact, the lore has gotten out of a hand that people have shown up at the property with shovels in search of yet another myth, the devil baby, which of course is the most well-known one. However, there is some truth to the haunting rumors. Jane Adams herself, who was the person that established Hull House, referred to one of the rooms as the haunted room. And over the years, staff have reported witnessing the apparitions in it. Uh, people that have gone there have seen strange photos that show up out of the house and that appear to show like a ghost-like figure. However, don't ask the staff on the property about the haunting because they really don't like to talk about it. But remember, this location used to work with the families that used to live in the tenements and also as an orphanage. So there's plenty of candidates as to who could be haunting it. Now, the next one is a location at... 2740 North Pine Grove Avenue, apartment 15B Boy in Lincoln Park. This has to do with the murder of a woman by the name of Teresita Bassa. The story is that in 1977, a young respiratory therapist named Teresita Bassa was found naked with a knife in her chest inside a burning Lincoln Park apartment. Police investigated. They received a call from the husband of Bassa's co-worker claiming his wife, Remy Chua, was going into trances and speaking in another language. Now, during the trance, his wife appeared to be channeling Bassa, who named an orderly from the hospital where they both worked as the killer. Not only that, according to research, the voice coming from Chua also listed jewelry taken from Bassa's apartment and where it could be found. The voice turned out to be right. And an orderly by the name of Alan Shawry later was found in possession of the jewelry and was convicted of the murder in 1979. So there you have a short list of ghost stories in the Windy City. And again, thank you all for being part of my audience. You're all wonderful. Take care. <laughs>